my name is Rich Lang, and I'm the pastor here at the temple, and I wanted to uh, uh, just take a couple minutes to set out what this is all about. And, and I thought I'd give you a little bit of history about why this came about, and also kind of a vision of, of what it could become, depending on all of us. Uh, years ago, when I came to Seattle, um, about 12 years ago, I had this, um, this vision that, um, um, and, and it was wrapped around the anti-war movement. And I felt at the time that the anti-war movement was just kind of going in circles. And we were okay at, at assembling groups of people to go on marches, but there was never a follow-up. And there didn't seem to me to be a strategy. And, and I, I just kept asking myself questions about effectiveness. And then, and many of you will know this, and then um, I, I'm forgetting the groups now, but there was Snow and what was the answer? And there was one more with an S. Um, Anyway, they started squabbling with each other. And, and I, I got to thinking, well, how, how can we create something that teaches us the basic social skills of how to compromise with each other and how to listen to each other and how to work together, even if we don't agree with each other 100%, if we're basically going to the same shore, how do we, how do we get there? And um, so I, I began to retrieve this old model, this wonderful nugget from history that many of you might have heard about and many of you might not have. It was the Highlander Institute. And the Highlander Institute, how many of you have heard about it? Oh, okay, I'll be, I'll be brief. I mean, it was this beautiful, beautiful model of, of basically training people in civil rights. I mean, they were first training union organizers in the Deep South, and then it, and I think it erupted, or um, it evolved out of the 40s and the 50s, and then they began training the civil rights, the freedom, the freedom riders went through the Highlander, Rosa Parks was trained there, Martin Luther King was trained there, the Berrigan brothers got training there, uh, the song We Shall Overcome was written there, I believe. Um, and so this, it's this wonderful little nugget of history, and I began to ask myself, how could we, and it's still around, by the way, so if you Google it, it's still there. Um, they just keep on keeping on. And of course, they were shut down in the 60s because they were accused of being communists, but that's par for the course. Um, and I was asking myself, well, how can we create a Highlander, um, a house, where basically people know that they could come, they could continually, no matter, you know, you don't have to come every week, it's not church, um, but you know, you could come and, <laughs> but there is a church. Um, <laughs> Um, but it was a place to come, to gather, to draw strength from each other, to strategize, to be trained, and to keep the movement alive. You know, uh, throwing kindling on the fire at all times. And a couple of times that I, I gave a call out, a shout out to the city, the responses were actually pretty good. 30 people would show up, one time 45 people showed up, and it was basically all one-off meetings. And the bottom line of these meetings, um, is we'd get around and we'd get excited and we'd talk about what it could possibly be. And we were North Enders and Seattle for the most part. And then the question of diversity came up. Well, we're not diverse. And the next thing we knew, nobody came for second round. Um, and so uh, that vision just kind of withered away. I didn't quite know um, what all to do about that. Kept building net my own networks and la da 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 da. And then Occupy hit and I went up to the camps and I became an Occupy chaplain, and I was hanging out, and I was very excited about Occupy. I, I really believed that there was a moment, and the window opened, and uh, in my language, I think the spirit was doing something, um, and in and, and our body politics, something happened in America, something happened to us all, that a, that a window did get opened, and, and a belief in democracy, and maybe there's something we could do about this massive corruption in our system. Um, and, and the state then, you know, shut them down. But before they shut them down, as I kept going up um, to the encampment, um, the dysfunction was pretty rampant towards the end. And it was getting pretty unhealthy there at the end. And, but I asked myself um, a basic question. And that is, until the Occupy energy is connected to people like me, I am middle class, I have networks, I have power, I have privilege, I have status. Until those two come together, all the Occupy movement, this is my opinion, all the Occupy movement is gonna be is more protests. And we need something more powerful than that. And that's really what launched this idea. And it took me some months to think it through. 
And here's the vision of this. Uh, what it will become, I don't know. But the vision of, of a common good conversational cafe with maybe a little food thrown in uh, eventually um, is a place for an ongoing place, a weekly place for people to come to get some information, yes, but then the most important part and the magical part is to break into groups and learn the skills of trust and affection and nurture and respect that it takes to build a movement, getting people to just to talk with each other, to meet each other, and even if there's some disagreements, uh, look for the common ground. And that's really what this is about. And so um, seven wonderful people responded to uh, an appeal, uh, my appeal to them to, would you come and speak? Would you be the prop? Would you, would you be the person that draws folks together? Um, and would you give us pertinent and, and relevant information about what I consider at least to be one of the huge issues of our time, and that's corporate power. Um, and so we, we created this seven week series where some great people are gonna come and they're gonna give great information but the magic is going to be after that information is given in the way we learn to discuss with each other. Um, um, I'm hoping personally that out of this, out of, uh, over time, strategy will develop, networks will develop, new energy will develop, um, and what began in Occupy can continue to grow uh, through us and in our own networks. Um, and and that's, the, that's the vision of, of what this is all about. Um, we're in a church basement. It's a very typical church basement, um, and it's a very wonderful church basement. And um, what um, a, a quick vision of what I'd love to be able to see happen here is for this to be a place that um, gets a little, you know, little paint around, you know, new paintly, and throw some stuff on the walls, make it colorful, make it bright, but also um, eventually get a maybe a nonprofit group, maybe Roots, which is a young adult shelter in this very building. Maybe they would run a, a little coffee stand or something out of the, that's called the intersect, that room back there. Um, uh, maybe we would uh, start throwing some potlucks. Maybe we'd have um, soup and sandwich beforehand so people could gather and eat and then come in and have a discussion. Uh, Jim and I were talking beforehand and, and expand. It's not just about the brain, it's about the feeling. Maybe we can get some uh, more artists in here to sing, an open mic night, spoken word. Um, having this to be a place to uh, have some cross-cultural and also uh, cross-class communication. And, um, but all that's just vision. And what it will become is, is whatever those of you who come make it. Um, what I'm doing here is there is a real open invitation to, uh, to, uh, and, and an ask here to help me build something for the good of our city, um, knowing that we're on the north side of Seattle. And uh, that has great potential, and that has some limitations. So, um, so I really am appreciative of you coming. The seven weeks that we're looking at is going to be great. We're going to shut it down in the summer. We're going to relaunch in the fall. And part of that is we're in Seattle, and to try to do anything in the summer is just self-defeating. Um, once, once the blue sky comes out, we're gone. Last thing is, and I'm about to call uh, Jeff up, and he'll talk about it a bit more, but there is one more agenda. And the agenda was this, to come and hear stuff and even to talk about stuff, but not to do something with the stuff you hear is boring to me. And um, so part of this cafe experience is to always attach some sort of action. And these actions will evolve and develop. But over the course of the seven weeks, the big action that, that we're getting at and the reason for the corporate theme is this initiative that has been created called I-103. Jeff will explain that in just a few, sec a few minutes. Um, you've got these little things here. There's a website, and that's why it's on your, uh, your, um, um, uh, uh, your uh, chair. And um, um, we're gathering, we're in the signature gathering stage right now. And if you would like to be a part of that, there's, right, again, right by Anita and other places around here, there's a place you can sign if you're a Seattle resident. Um, it's a Seattle initiative, and if you'd like to help um, gather signatures, let us know. And if you really want to know more about this, after Jeff uh, sits down, just stick around at 9 o'clock and just chat with Jeff and I, and we'll tell you more about it. It's pretty exciting stuff. Um, lastly, if you would take this, take, take your sheet of paper. Um, 
just created some guidelines for when we do break out and chat together. And um, these seven guidelines, I'm not going to read them, you can read them yourself. But again, a big primary purpose tonight is not simply to listen to a great presentation by Alex. It's to be able to have a conversation together. And so I just call upon the, the inner heart of each one of you and the inner leader in each one of you that when you're in little small groups and we eventually break apart and have some discussions, to be very respectful of the other person, uh, to be curious, so curious that you want to hear what another person thinks, and to be mindful of preacher mouth. <laughs> that, you know, you don't have to do all the talking. Sometimes listening is okay. And with that, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks, Rich, for the introduction. Thanks for um, putting this whole series together. I'm Jeff Reifman, and I'm co-organizing Initiative 103 with, with Rich. Um, I'm here to introduce Alex Stone from the Economic Opportunity Institute. I first heard about EOI in 2004 when I was writing an article for Seattle Weekly about what kind of citizen is Microsoft. And I interviewed one of their researchers, Marilyn Watkins, um, so EOI is out there sort of gathering facts about um, how Washington State works, how its finances work, um, how its education system is working, how our budget process is working. And Alex is going to talk a lot more about that. What I've seen, because you all know that we have, you've been told we have a, a budget problem. With EOI's work, what I've learned is that we have a tax fairness problem. Um, what I, I've been reporting on Microsoft's Nevada tax dodge literally for eight years now. And in that time, I would say that I haven't been very effective. <laughs> um, the amount of money they've saved has just gone up and up, and um, the cuts to education have, have grown. Um, the stats are pretty dark. So I think in addition to a tax fairness problem in Washington State, which Alex will talk about, um, we have an issue with connecting um, what are some of the core problems in Washington State, in Seattle, with our neighbors. It's great to see so many of you out on such a beautiful night um, because you could all be someplace else. And I've been very touched seeing um, the people who come out and care about these issues in the face of things not really going well, things not really changing, and yet people still care. Um, so I think what we need to be doing is getting other people to understand what these causes are, and part of that's these common good cafes getting facts and information so that we understand the issues well. But part of it is connecting with people, um, and this is where I'm kind of tricking all of you because um, with Initiative 103, I've actually been out on the streets gathering a lot of signatures, and so I've been talking to a lot of people, and I thought I was going to hate it. Um, <laughs> I thought it would be such a drag, but it, it's actually been really powerful for me because it's a chance one-on-one -on -one with hundreds of people to tell them about what you're concerned about in the state, um, which for me, it's about the influence of corporate power and corporate money over the way things run here. Um, and it's a way to stand up and, as an embodied person, as a resident of Seattle and Washington, and tell other people that I care enough about these issues to volunteer my time to stand out here and tell you about them and ask you to sign to place I-103 on the ballot. So I'm here tonight in part to ask all of you um, to consider volunteering to do that same thing, which is to um, learn about I-103 and consider volunteering to get out at events with us and gather signatures. We need um, 20,600 valid Seattle voter signatures, and we're not going to be able to do that in time for the November ballot without a lot of help from you. So May and June, that's we're just really trying to um, get it all done in May and June. So we're focusing on all the festivals. So next week is the next weekend is the U District Street Fair. And there's a bunch of us that are going to be out here near the church gathering signatures. And we'd love to have your help. And the same thing with the Folklife Festival underneath the Space Needle for four days and nights. We're going to be out there gathering signatures and telling people, bringing the message that corporate influence is hurting all of us. It's hurting education in Washington. And I-103 is part of changing that. And just the process of communicating our concern to people is very powerful. And that's, that's what we're out there doing. So I hope that after you've heard Alex talk, and if you have more questions about I-103, or you have a great time talking to each other, that you'll go to the website and click on the volunteer button. It's right at the top and sign up for one of the days where you can gather signatures um, 
So with that, I want to um, introduce Alex. Alex has been with EOI for a couple of years. I'm told he, I read that he plays rugby. Um, I'm not sure about that. What do you guys think? But anyway, come on up and tell us about um, the Washington State budget. Thanks for coming tonight. Thanks, Jeff. As Jeff said, my name is Alex Stone. I'm with the Economic Opportunity Institute. Can everybody hear? Yes? OK. Um, and I'm the communications manager. EOI is a state policy think tank, so to speak. Uh, we work on middle class issues, uh, educational opportunity, living wages, uh, the state tax structure and the state budget. Um, we do uh, work for middle class families. So the first thing that I want to talk about is why we have government. What is uh, the point of our government? Uh, in the Constitution, it states uh, to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. I thought Jim's songs were particularly poignant, uh, given what I'm going to be talking about. But uh, in reality, we have government. When we think about what we use government for, it's to uh, educate our kids or to make sure the foods and medicines that we use are safe. Um, it's so we know that uh, we can drive to work and there's not going to be too many potholes, although that's sometimes questionable here in Seattle. Uh, these, these are the things that government provides us. It provides a public good. So this is Washington State budget. Uh, as you can see, the big blue area there is K through 12 education. This shows that the state spends 44% of its resources on K through 12 education. I do want to make a note uh, for all you budget hawks out there. This is the state's general fund. This does not include any of the money that we get from the federal government for uh, food stamps or Medicaid or anything like that. Uh, it also excludes transportation, roads and bridges and stuff like that. So this is strictly uh, money from the state, from uh, state tax revenue, and we spend most of it on K through 12 education. A lot of money also goes to social and health services, uh, to the basic health plan, to assisting uh, people with mental disabilities or who are developmentally disabled. 8% uh, goes to higher education, 5% to corrections. And then we've got some general government and uh, servicing the debt. So how do we fund the budget? How do we pay for all of these things that we like, like education and health care and maybe some things that we don't like too? Uh, we do it through the sales tax. You can see here the blue bar. This is 49% of our state budget is funded by the sales tax. Washington State's pretty unique in this sense. We have a pretty imbalanced state tax structure. If you think of our tax structure like a stool, it really only has two legs. One is the sales tax and the other leg is everything else. So when sales tax revenues drop off, like they do during a recession, we have a lot of problems funding K-12 education, basic health, higher education. Uh, these are things that are really important in terms of the public good, in terms of what we rely on government for. But when we don't have the tax revenues to fund these things, uh, we simply can't do it. It's a binary choice. Here are some of the budget cuts that Washington has made. I, will, I know that some of you are far in the back and can't see, so I will uh, go ahead and read them off. At the bottom, we have K-12 through education. That's been cut by $2.7 billion over the past three years. Uh, this represents a total of about $11 billion in cuts. Uh, this is over the past three years. The majority of it's come from K-12 through education, uh, also from state employee compensation. This includes teacher pay. Uh, health care, the basic health plan, uh, has been decimated. It used to serve about 125,000 people. Uh, the basic health plan provides health care for folks who are working but who are low income uh, and whose employers do not provide health care. Uh, it now provides health care for about 30,000 people. Uh, 125,000 is what it did uh, less than five years ago. Uh, higher education, 1.3 billion. Um, I'm sure you've heard of all the tuition increases that are happening. This is a direct correlation. You've got 1.3 billion dollars cut out of higher education. Other human services, uh, DSHS, long-term care, criminal justice, natural resources, parks, all these things have been cut too. Okay, so why is this happening? Uh, why do we have all of these cuts happening? Uh, the reason I put this guy up here, this is Governor Clarence Daniel Martin. He was elected in 1933 uh, as the governor of Washington State. He was the last person who signed substantive tax reform in our state. He signed the Revenue Act. Uh, and the Revenue Act basically took Washington from uh, an agrarian economy to one that was industrial and manufacturing based. Prior to 
the Revenue Act, Washington State has had mostly just property taxes. That's what it relied on. Uh, and the farmers were getting really upset. There was a lot of people moving into urban areas who weren't paying taxes because the only tax was the property tax. So they got together with their grain associations. They said, hey, we got to do something about this. We're paying all the taxes. And those folks in the city aren't paying any. Well, naturally, the folks in the city didn't want to pay taxes. But they got together, and they passed the Revenue Act of 1935. The Revenue Act of 1935 instituted a gross uh, uh, a B and O tax, which is a business and occupation tax on gross sales. It's the same exact tax that we have today. It instituted a sales tax on goods only, which is the same exact sales tax that we have today. Uh, it instituted property tax changes that are very similar to the way property taxes are calculated today. And it also instituted an income tax. That income tax was later found unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. So those tax changes were made. And it's pretty similar to the tax system we have now, with the exception that we've added about 500 tax exemptions since then. So here's your structural deficit. Um, this is one of the reasons that we're in the situation we're in today. Uh, Washington has a goods-only sales tax. You only pay sales tax on goods. So if you go to see your stockbroker or your accountant or your lawyer uh, or the veterinarian, these are things that typically upper-income people use, you don't pay sales tax, but you do on diapers, on cars, on other goods. Uh, as you can see, the blue here represents people's purchasing decisions in 1959. They were purchasing more food and beverages, more other goods, that's your diapers and your cars, and more services. Uh, I'm sorry, and fewer services. Now, we have a service-based economy. We have made yet another change. We went from agrarian to industrial, and now we are changing from industrial to service-based. But our, our tax structure is stuck in an industrial-based uh, economy. So what happens is people buy more services, which aren't taxed, less of other things, which are taxed, and we have a structural deficit. This, I think, uh, explains the problem pretty well. The bottom line is taxable retail sales. This is the amount of tax revenue that the state gets when people buy stuff. Uh, the top line is personal income. This is just for Washington State. Washington State does not have a personal income tax. If Washington State did have a personal income tax, you can see the tax revenue would be growing with the economy. Uh, currently, our state tax system does not grow with our economy. Another reason, tax exemptions. You heard me mention that we have about 500, uh, 570 odd tax exemptions. And I call them tax exemptions, not tax loopholes, because they aren't some loophole that somebody's exploiting. These are uh, tax exemptions that have been uh, lobbied for in the state legislature and won by special interest groups. Uh, there's a couple up here that I put up here. There's uh, elective cosmetic surgery, for example, is not subject to the sales tax in Washington State. Uh, there's a $23 million tax break for out-of-state coal that comes into the state. Uh, there's a $46 million tax break for public utilities uh, for their corporate transportation. Uh, these are some of the decisions that have been made in the state legislature to prioritize these tax exemptions over funding our public services. Now, I will say there are some tax exemptions that provide a public good. Uh, they do have a return on investment greater than the, than the money that we're giving away. But there's no way to verify this. Uh, there's no sunset provision written into most tax exemptions. So uh, if a tax exemption stops serving its good, a company can still claim it without actually providing any benefit to the state. Reason number two. So reason number one is our structural deficit. Reason number two is uh, inequity and inequality. Washington's tax structure is built for Scrooge McDuck. I mean, he would benefit greatly from living here in Washington. This is, and I know this is tough to see. I apologize in advance. Uh, let me step back here, though. The bottom line here is the bottom 90% of folks, and this is their average income since 1970, has actually decreased by 7%. Everybody else, that for the top 10%, it's gone up by 75%. For the top 1%, it's gone up by 166%. And up here, it's gone up by 650% for people at the top 0.01 category. 
uh, all of the income gains that should come with productivity for the middle class, for people who are working, uh, have instead gone to the top and they're being uh, doled out in golden parachutes and stock dividends and capital gains. This is just another variation on that theme. You can see that total income in the US is clearly going to the top 1%. So, uh, Washington's tax structure. Uh, we don't have an income tax, we rely on a sales tax, and that means that poor people pay more. So somebody whose income is $20,000 pays the same amount of sales tax on a box of diapers as somebody whose income is $200,000. They have a much higher effective tax rate. That means that the average state and local tax burden for people who are very poor is 17% in this state. For people in the top 1%, it's about 2.6%. This is the B&O taxes in Washington, these business and occupation taxes. Um, we don't have a, a corporate income tax, we just have a, a B&O tax. And the rates range depending on whether you're selling goods or providing services. But as you can see, small businesses pay a much higher rate than larger businesses. This is not an accident. This is because larger businesses have lobbyists. Uh, they go down to the state legislature and they say, hey, we don't wanna pay uh, sales taxes on the airplanes that we sell in the state, hypothetically. Uh, smaller businesses, they end up paying most of their taxes in sales taxes. And uh, part of the discussion that we need to have in this state is about whether or not we want to incentivize small businesses, whether we think it's good for people to start small businesses. Um, fixing our state B&O tax structure is certainly an integral part of com uh, a complete tax reform discussion in Washington. Okay, reason number three. So we've got uh, the structural deficit, and we've got inequity. The third reason is inadequacy. Washington State Spending adjusted for both inflation and population is lower now than it's been in decades. We spend just over $2,100 per state resident annually. Back in 1991, we spent 2,600, and it's been right around that level just until recently. Uh, the reason for that is because, as I've said before, our state taxes are not tracking the economy. Uh, if we had had a state income tax, we would have had $12 billion more in this state budget. Uh, that would have paid for a heck of a lot more teachers. It would have paid for lower class sizes. It would have paid for lower tuition. Uh, it would have kept the basic health plan. Um, that, that's a significant amount of money. So here it is in action. Uh, this is Washington's rank in K-12 spending. Per $1,000 in personal income, we rank 46th in the country. That's below Mississippi. Uh, per pupil, it's at 31. Uh, so for a state that considers ourselves to be uh, a high-tech state, uh, we're certainly not investing the dollars in K-12 through education uh, that many of us think that we are. This is uh, Washington's higher education spending per en enrolled student. It's also lower over the past couple decades than it's ever been. Uh, we're now spending just under $6,000. Uh, we used to spend upwards of $8,000 per student uh, for the UW. The UW also used to, or this, I'm sorry, the state used to cover about 70% of the cost of tuition. Well, the student covered about 30. Uh, that is now flipped. And the state now covers about 30%, while uh, the student covers about 70%. This is UW tuition as a percentage of family income, median income. Uh, it used to be about 6% of median income. It was, you know, I remember my dad telling me that he worked his way through college. Uh, there's, there's absolutely no way that you could do that now unless, uh, I suppose, you already had a doctorate. Um, it, it's now 20% of family income. Uh, WSU just increased tuition by 16% for next year. They're going to be at about $12,000. The UW, uh, in June, is set to vote on another tuition increase. They increased tuition by 20% last year. It's gonna go up by another 16% this year uh, to be over $12,000 after tuition and fees. So after a four year degree, I'm not all that good at math, but that's a lot of money. So uh, despite these problems that we're having in the state, the state legislature has made commitments. Uh, they've said, we're going to invest in education. 
Uh, we're going to make sure that every kid uh, has access to preschool. We're going to make sure that no class is over uh, 17 students. Um, we're going to increase degree and certificate awards at colleges and universities by 40 percent. All of this by 2018. But the question is, how do you do that without money? You need to hire more teachers. You need to invest in technology. Uh, you need to make infrastructure upgrades. Uh, and these things don't come for free. So the state has been sued. Uh, a group of parents got together in 2007 and uh, sued the state and said, you are not meeting your paramount duty to educate kids. In our state constitution, it lists the paramount duty of the state as to make ample provision for the education of all children residing within its borders. And the parents won. In 2010, uh, King County Court judge ruled in favor of the parents. And then just a little bit earlier this year, it's called the McCleary case. Uh, the state Supreme Court also held in favor of the parents. And what they said was that the state is not making it its paramount duty. It is not providing ample funding and it is not providing, quote, basic education and skills needed to compete in today's economy and meaningfully participate in the state's democracy. Now, the state Supreme Court, in an unusual move, actually retained the right of oversight over the state legislature to make sure that they implemented reforms by 2018. So back to the taxes. This is how we fund lower class sizes, health care, lower tuition. Uh, Washington State is on your right hand side here. There's your left hand side, excuse me. With our almost half of our uh, state taxes coming from the sales tax. Uh, this is the US average on the other side. And you'll see this big green chunk of pie here. These are individual income taxes. Washington State is just one state out of, I'm sorry, it's one of seven states in this country that doesn't have a personal income tax. Now, most of the other states that have personal income taxes have another source of revenue. Uh, one of them is Nevada. Nevada allows gambling. And this is one of their big sources of revenue. Alaska, they have oil. So does Texas. So does North Dakota. Um, Washington has none of these resources. And so we are stuck with declining revenues because of a recession. And it's not just because of the recession. Uh, it is indicative of a larger problem. Uh, our economy is changing. We are no longer a manufacturing economy as much as presidential candidates would like to think that we are. Uh, we are a service-based economy, and we need to adapt to uh, a state tax structure that will provide the state services that kids and families and parents need uh, in order to fund our democracy. Christine Gregoire, current uh, governor of this state, just made this statement the other day. Uh, she said to the candidates who are running, we can say no new revenue, but the reality is we, c we cannot live up to our responsibilities without new revenue. Uh, this is in response to both candidates on the campaign trail uh, making wildly outlandish statements about investing in education uh, and not talking about where this money is going to come from. The reality is, is that we need substantive tax reform in Washington in order to achieve any of these things. Um, we need to uh, reduce our structural deficit. We need to create a system that is uh, not as unequal as the one that we have now and not as regressive. And we need to create a system that provides ample funding. Um, one of the ways to do that is to tax services. Uh, another way to do that is to add in a personal individual income tax and lower the sales tax so it's not as regressive. Uh, we need to address the inequities in our business tax system. And we need to make sure that whatever we do raises revenue that is sufficient for the priorities that we have as a state. Um, I, when we think about what we want to do and what we can do together and the investments that we need to make, uh, looking towards the future. I think that we all realize that education, that health care, uh, and that taking care of the people around us are really priorities that we have in this state. And we need a tax structure that reflects those priorities. So 
I feel like I've talked long enough, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. The question is about barriers to implementing an income tax and whether or not a two-thirds rule applies. Uh, if, an, if an income tax were, tax were to be passed by the legislature right now because of uh, the two-thirds, the supermajority rule from Tim Iman's initiative, uh, it would require two-thirds of the legislature to approve that. If it were to be by a vote of the people, it would only require a, a simple majority, 51%. Uh, of people, and then no action by the legislature. It would just have to pass on a on a simple initiative to the people, simple majority. Uh, no action required by the legislature. So why have we had all the trouble getting it through? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we don't have that much time. Was the comment? You know, I mean, it, initiative 1098, uh, I believe, received about 37 percent support in this state. Uh, I think that there probably isn't um, uh, a widespread understanding of the current state of our tax structure and, uh, and what's going on. And there's also been a failure of leadership in the legislature to lead on this issue. Yes, the question is whether uh, you could combine a reduction in the sales tax with a full-scale income tax, one that affected the middle class as well. Let me just, for those who don't know, Initiative 1098 was the initiative two years ago that would have created a high incomes income tax on people earning, I believe, over $200,000. Um, there's a rule for initiatives that they must uh, be a single subject. So it, it has to be a single subject rule. There's some question as to whether or not uh, a tax reform in itself is a single subject. So can you do one thing and another thing and another thing and call it a single subject? Uh, there's a lot of people who think that you probably can. Um, an income tax, either way, would be challenged in the courts. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, an income tax was ruled un unconstitutional in 1938 when they had uh, some weird precedent set for uh, what was considered property. Uh, since then, the precedent that that, was, uh, that that ruling was found on has been overturned. So there's uh, a lot of constitutional scholars who think that, sure, if the people voted in favor of an income tax, there's no way the Supreme Court uh, could find it unconstitutional now. Yes? That was the state Supreme Court who uh, struck down the income tax in 1935. Yes. Uh, I'll go to you first. I, I saw you. Yes. You know, I think the only way that uh, tax reform will happen, especially if it's by ballot initiative, uh, is, uh, well, to be passed by ballot initiative, is for there to be uh, an understanding in the state about what's actually going on. Uh, and I talked with Rich uh, at the break about um, some, of the, some of the reasons that people supported 1098 and some of the reasons that people didn't support 1098. And we found that uh, the majority of people who typically would have been split on 1098 but voted in favor of it were people who had kids in school, who saw the value of lower class sizes, who saw the value of more teachers, of uh, more instruction time, of uh, more infrastructure upgrades at schools, because that's what 1098 was about. It was about investing in education and in healthcare. Uh, <clears throat> most of the people who didn't, didn't have kids in school or had kids in private school. Um, and so there wasn't that sense of community, of public good that uh, these other people saw. And I think that building that sense and uh, reminding people that we're all in this together, that our economy is not gonna function well unless we produce a lot of well-educated people, especially for the type of jobs that are going to be available uh, here 20, 30 years down the line, uh, then, then we're going to have a big problem. Yes. I would just say uh, I haven't read Tax Shift. Uh, there, is, there is a lot of um, uh, evidence that shows that creating social policy through taxation is good. This is what we do with uh, taxing uh, sin taxes, you know, alcohol, tobacco, things that we don't want people to use. Uh, we tax more. So the question is uh, about the taxation of services. Um, so, and, and any possible strategies. So the big challenge with uh, taxing services in a way that isn't comprehensive structural tax reform is you have a lot of constituencies. Uh, think accountants, lawyers, uh, veterinarians, stockbrokers, uh, people who don't aren't required to collect sales tax on their services, uh, and who would be. And these are people who have money, they have friends, 
and they have power. Um, that is the big impediment, I think. I think that everybody wants their special carve out, just like we have now with all these uh, tax exemptions. And that's part of the reason that we are where we are now. I think educating people uh, and helping them understand, look, the reason that you're paying 9.5% sales tax is because we don't tax these services. It's a subsidy. We are providing a subsidy to the people who use lawyers and stockbrokers and accountants who don't pay taxes, and instead, we're paying it on everything else that we buy, like cars, diapers, um, and helping people understand that and saying, look, we can lower the tax rate. We could lower it, you know, two, three, four percentage points. Uh, and if we started to tax services without any loss in revenue. So I think it's an education campaign. Yes. So the, I, I'll address the first part first, which is about uh, taxation and how people understand uh, that where their tax dollars go in, in, in the east-west divide. Um, you know, there's been studies done that show uh, net in and out taxes in, in counties. Uh, King County is a net out state. Uh, we send a lot more money out of the state than, uh, or I'm sorry, out of the county than we do, uh, than we do keep in the county. Uh, we're one of the few counties that actually does that. In fact, almost every county on the east side of the mountains uh, is, you know, for every dollar that they get in, that they pay in taxes, they get a dollar fifteen back or a dollar twenty back or more. Uh, and and this is the reality. And there's plenty of uh, if you if you get on the internet, and I can provide some information about that. Um, I think the challenge with doing that is uh, then you create this consumer mentality about the public good and about what we're doing. And I think that, um, and, and that's part of the problem in general, is people have a consumer mentality. You know, they, it's the vending machine, right? I pay money, uh, I pay property taxes, and I don't have any kids, so why is my money going to public schools? Um, and, and that's part of the issue. You know, it's, it's, we're, in this, we're in this together. And, uh, the, the taxes that we pay here in King County, you know, maybe they go to pay for roads in Spokane, uh, and maybe some of their money comes to pay for uh, ferries over here. And, and that's just the reality of living in a state and in a, in a society uh, where we have common goals. Um, second part of your question, I believe almost every county, maybe with the exception of one or two, is a net importer of tax money. So they pay out less than they receive. So if, if they pay a dollar in taxes, they get a dollar fifteen back, for example. Well, no, because King County is subsidizing them. Yes. Yep. 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 Yeah. And, and, and a lot more in some cases. And a lot more in some cases. And it, there's, it, there's, you know, there's a lot more poverty over there. So the question is about establishing a state bank and using the profits to pay for K through twelve education. Or, or, sure. Um, I know that one legislator, Bob Hasegawa, has done a lot of work on the idea of a state bank and the possibility of a state bank. Currently, the only state that has one, I think, is North Dakota. Uh, and it was created during the Great Depression by farmers uh, who got screwed um, by the other banks uh, when they lost all their deposits. There's some questions about whether or not that would be constitutional in Washington. Uh, we have a different constitution than uh, North Dakota, but but I know that <laughs> change it. I know that uh, they are exploring the possibility at the legislative level, and Bob Hasegawa uh, is doing a lot of good work in that. Uh, and I don't, th you know, I think it's definitely an idea that needs to be explored. I, um, I don't, I don't know that I could speak to that. Um, I think that at any given time, um, politicians may give a different answer. Um, I think that there is more support now for structural tax reform, and I think a lot of people recognize, uh, you know, the, the same thing that I've shown you tonight, that structural tax reform, uh, in order for it to be successful, is probably going to have to include an individual income tax. So that is also an idea that's been explored, and it's a fantastic idea. Let me stop and say that. Kudos to you. Um, part of the problem is, is uh, again, when you want to, uh, when you're going to gang up, so to speak, on tax exemptions, uh, then you're going to get pressure back. You're going to get all the bankers and all of uh, the truckers and wh whoever benefits, and they're going to line up and say, no way, man. Uh, Reuben Carlisle, this past year, I believe, had a bill to, that would sunset tax exemptions. Um, I don't think it went anywhere. 
uh, although it would it would have sunsetted new tax exemptions I think that um, what would be more what would be a very effective way to go about it is to uh, and this is something that we've debated debated in the OI office uh, an initiative that would require all tax exemptions to prove that they are providing economic benefit to the state and and if they don't then they're ended uh, and it's very simple you know if if you want a tax exemption from the state of Washington you have to prove that you're providing a benefit and you know like I said some tax exemptions do provide that benefit there's a committee called JLARC the joint legislative audit review committee I think uh, and they're a citizen commission that reviews these tax exemptions um, about a third of all tax exemptions that they review they find are not providing any economic benefit to the state and none whatsoever well, this, this JLARC group is a citizen commission. I, I think there's about a dozen people on it. Uh, and they do maybe 30 or 40 of these things every year. And they, I think they've gotten through about 100, 100 200 so far. Uh, the problem is the legislature taking action on these and, and finding a majority of people who will take action. Uh, because it's very difficult to end tax breaks. It requires a two-thirds majority. Yes. Hey, how about let's give uh, Alex another round of applause. <laughs> Um, I would like to end with, uh, uh, Jim's going to sing us out in a minute, but, um, um, and, and again, you stick around, 9 o'clock is basically the witching hour, so stick around, talk, chat, and I'm, and, but about 9 o'clock is when we'll shut it down totally. But I, I'm going to ask Jeff to give a very quick story about his own personal experience with Microsoft, um, and it's a great story of why we're so hot to trot about initiative um, I-103. So, thanks, Jeff. Thanks. Um, so, how many were here at our kickoff and already heard this story? I'll make it more exciting. Just one, okay, that's good. Um, so, since 2004, I, I wrote this story called Citizen Microsoft for the Weekly, and we uncovered that Microsoft opened an office in Reno, Nevada to dodge the state's tax called the royalty tax. It's part of the BNO structure. The tax used to be 1.5% on worldwide sales of uh, licensed software, so like all the windows that get sold to big companies and, and put on uh, hard drives for Dell and stuff like that. Um, so in the first story in 2004, they were saving about $40 million a year. I think it had risen to like $70 million a year. Um, but this went on for 12 years and around, um, I think, 2008, 2009, when the state's deficit began to grow up towards $2.25 billion, I took a look and I ran the numbers again. And it turned out that um, Microsoft's tax dodge was approaching a billion dollars over this time frame. And in the same period of time, the company had earned 480 billion in revenue. Now, I'm speaking quickly from memory, so some of my numbers may be slightly off. But um, what's interesting is back in 1998, right when they began this practice, they and the other software companies in the state lobbied to reduce the tax rate from 1.5% um, to um, it's 0.484%. So they cut it by two thirds, essentially. So when I calculate this now, if you include the impact from their lobbying, so if you, you measure their savings from the original 1.5% rate, and you look at it over 12 years, and their Nevada tax dodge, um, it's $4.37 billion that just Microsoft on its own has saved from paying into the general fund. Now. When we look at those, the slide that Alex put up about the tax, uh, the revenue, the spending cuts to K through 12 education and higher ed in the last four years under Gregoire's watch, it's four billion dollars. Okay, so that's why I started out by saying tonight we don't have um, a budget problem in this state. What we have is a tax fairness problem, and what we have is an inability to educate people and get them engaged in this process. So. I started a blog called MicrosoftTaxDodge.com, and I started doing a lot of interviews and, um, well, one, um, except with the Seattle Times, which has not yet written about Microsoft's Nevada tax dodge, but um, what, what I started doing was trying to call this issue to the legislature and say, hey, you've got this $2.25 billion deficit and Microsoft saved over a billion dollars at the current tax rate in the royalty tax. Maybe you just close this loophole, ask them to pay back some of it. And by the way, Brad Smith, who's the general counsel of Microsoft, is always going around. Uh, he wrote an editorial in February for the Seattle Times about how education is a top priority. And um, you know, 
It, it sickens me at this point because the Seattle Times allows him to publish this unchallenged editorial about education's a priority and there's just no money. And so his solution is to raise the sales tax. So he wants us to pay more, okay? Um, and um, where was I? So basically I go to the legislature and the guy who runs the chair of the, the finance committee for the Democrats, who knows his name? Ross Hunter, okay. So Ross worked at Microsoft for 17 years. I also happened to work there for eight years. But, but um, so Ross helped lead the change to the definition of the royalty tax. So instead of being a tax on sales to worldwide customers and exposing about $30 billion a year of Microsoft's revenue, it's now a tax on just sales to Washington state customers. Okay, so essentially what happened is they should have been paying this tax on $30 billion a year and now they're they should be paying, and they probably have started paying it, but it's a tax on maybe just half a percent of that amount. So basically, he just redefined the tax, and then he also included a one-sentence clause to give the, the um, any company that had been recently field audited by the Department of Revenue in the last five years. Now, who thinks the Department of Revenue might actually do an audit of Microsoft? You know, they, they do. Um, it, um, so basically he gave any company that had a, had a field audit um, forgiveness for any tax violations. Um, and the, so remember, our, this is the Democratic-led Washington State Legislature that just passed this through and then the governor passed it. And then shortly after that, the governor appointed Susan Del Bene, who I used to work with at Microsoft, she's an ex-Microsoft employee, um, to run the tax department. Now, I, I know what Susan's business background is, and I know her tax background, and it's, that's not a good fit for her. Um, and so her husband is Kurt Delbani, who I also used to work for, and um, he's the president of the Microsoft Office Division. So um, we have the head of the tax, depar tax department literally and figuratively in bed with Microsoft, okay? Um, so then the Microsoft and Boeing started um, a scholarship fund uh, a $25 million scholarship fund. They're giving $5 million a year for, uh, to fund uh, technology programs at the UW because, um, well, the, 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 the co collegiate system here has been so badly defunded. <laughs> so the governor goes out, I, you might have heard her on KUOW earlier this year, praising Microsoft and Boeing for their $5 million a year contribution, um, which is just disgusting, really, because she signed the bill to give them over a $100 million a year tax break. She's controlling the Department of Revenue and telling them not to enforce this tax, not asking her attorneys to challenge the company to pay what it owes. So um, that's where we are. That's what I started my activism around this issue. And what I saw is the Democrats, who I always thought were pretty good in Washington state, basically just rolled over and fixed the system for Microsoft. Now, I wasn't totally surprised because you know Microsoft's the hometown company. Um, I've been a beneficiary of of their success, other many other people have too. But we have a serious tax problem, and we have a serious revenue problem, as Alex pointed out. Like, you know, um, our class sizes, I think our, uh, what is it, 47th largest in the, in the country. We have the most regressive tax system. 18%, um, this is the most shocking statistic for me, 18% of freshmen at the UW are foreigners. Do you know why? They pay full rate. Yeah, six years ago, it was 2%. Okay, so we're taking our state educational infrastructure and turning it over to the highest bidder outside of Washington. That is disgusting. And um, so that is one of the things that led me to work on Initiative 103 with Rich and to get involved in a different organizing tactic. For me, I gave up on trying to petition the state legislature. I gave up on organizations whose primary strategy is to ask the state legislature to please make things better because I don't think that strategy is working. I look around and it's not working. And so we are trying to do something different. We're trying to um, get an ordinance, which is essentially a, a proposed law on the ballot to raise the issue of whether corporate influence in, in our city is having a positive or negative effect and allowing the voters of Seattle to have a discussion about it through November and vote on it. And so that's why Rich and I have been so passionately behind this. And just to close real briefly, what I-103 would do is it essentially would ban corporate spending on city elections. So that includes Costco with their $22 million liquor privatization initiative, not being able to advertise in Seattle. 
That includes the American Chemistry Council not being able to spend a million and a half dollars to stop the plastic bag ban. Um, it would also, Initiative 103 would restrict corporate lobbying to public forums. So you would only be able to talk to officials out in the open. So we wouldn't have an NBA arena plan coming that's been half-baked by the mayor and this private investor that we'd never heard of. Um, and just showing up, we would, be, we would be in the conversation from the beginning. And the other thing it does is it creates a community bill of rights around issues related to democracy. So rights to having citizen oversight of the police. Rich, how are your eyes these days after you got pepper sprayed? Are you doing better? Yeah. Um, we would have rights for nature. So we can do things like stop the coal train, which have you heard of the coal train yet? So, so there, we don't have as citizens in Seattle any rights to stop the coal train, um, except rights for nature on Initiative 103 would allow any of us to go to court and demand that um, Peabody Energy prove how they're going to keep arsenic and all the other poisons from the coal dust leaking into Puget Sound. Um, it would provide rights for workers. It would provide rights for neighborhoods. Um, so that's what 103 is about. It's about um, starting at the city level and also having other communities working with us. So Bellingham is running an initiative like this, and Spokane is running an initiative like this. I heard rumors that Skagit is running an initiative like this, or starting to. I know that Portland is in the planning stages. So partly we're changing the law locally and pushing change up from the grassroots, and partly we are inspiring other communities to work with us to do the same thing. And for me, this is inspiring work because we're making law, and it has effect immediately. And there was a great, uh, there's some polls out showing that 65% of Democrats and Republicans disapprove of Citizens United. So we're all in agreement on this. And Supreme Court approval ratings are now at the 25 year low. So there is a trend of the people seeing the Supreme Court as not representing Democratic interests, and that is only going to increase. And so we are, we feel like we're positioned with Initiative 103 uh, with the tide. So I need to wrap up. Again, if you would go to the website and click on the volunteer button or refer people to it, that would be great. Thank you very much.